Today on the show, we break down what the transition to entrepreneurship looks like, and in particular, do a very detailed case study on what estimated quarterly tax payments looks like for the entrepreneur. Allie writes in to share a frugal and productivity tip, and Scott weighs in to share how the financial independence community has rapidly transformed his life and that of his family's. Welcome to the Ultimate Crowdsource Personal Finance Show. This is your Friday Roundup. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. I'm really excited to talk about this past week's episode with Waffles on Wednesday. We really got a chance to dig into the solo 401k set by IRA. I know, Brad, that's something that we've talked about in the past and really wanted to do an episode on it. And I'm very excited about it. How's your week going, man? Yeah, going pretty well. Pretty well. We are actually recording this a little bit early because we're currently at FinCon in Orlando. Yeah, I've got my brother's wedding coming up on Friday here. So that is very interesting. We've got a lot of family in town, which is always fun. And doing our thing. We had a little uh, frugal win of the week, I guess you could say, at Old Navy last about four days ago, which is kind of cool. So Laura, she's a really great shopper. And in all honesty, I don't know that we did as, as good a job explaining that as we would have liked to have, but this was just kind of a cool thing. She actually uses the Old Navy credit card basically when she's in between cards on her, I guess, getting bonuses for travel rewards. So obviously that would take precedence, but when she's between cards, she uses her old Navy card, which I know sounds a little unusual, but she is like this super high status level at this card. I guess she's had it for like half her life basically. And they like inexplicably give her five cents per point and we shop at old Navy. So it's not like this is wasted. It's it, it's basically every single month. She practically gets what amounts to either a $35 gift card or usually $50 gift card. I've even seen her get like 90 bucks in one random month. So Old Navy is a pretty nice store. We shop there. We One just opened up about three miles from us. So it's where we shop basically. Laura and I went up there I because I guess I've been getting a little bit uh, in better shape, which is kind of, kind of cool. But the downside financially for that is you need some new clothes. So I realized that I don't have many pairs of jeans that fit me. And we went up there and got two really nice pairs of jeans. And I guess one little item for the kids, I think was socks or something like that. And it was about $63. That's what we walked up there with. But of course, Laura in her brilliance pulls out coupons. So she had this instant cash thing that got her 10 bucks off. And then she had a $50 gift card. The whole thing I think was under $3. I don't have the receipt in front of me. It was like two fifty-seven dollars with tax. And you should have seen Jonathan, the face on the clerk, I mean, she was astounded. She's like, wow, because the stuff that we bought was already on sale. So it should have been like $89 and change. And we walked out of there for under $3. So got to love a little frugal win of the week like that. And frankly, like we spend no money on clothes at this point because Laura just in her random off times where again, she's not going for a big travel rewards bonus. She's just using this card. So yeah, it's it definitely a win all around. Dude, I'm so bad at sales and Laura's like crushing it. So I like need to get a write up on exactly how this would work. Like I'm the one that always gets suckered in because, you know, when you go into Old Navy and you make a purchase and they give you like this Old Navy cash. Right. But I feel like they've got some sort of behind the scenes kind of scam going on because, you know, it's it's 25 percent off when you're there that day. You spend maybe 50 or 60 dollars and you get this 10 dollar or 20 dollar coupon, whatever it is. And then they say, come back next month between this date. But then you go back the following month. And then nothing's on sale, right? So you're getting $10 off, but nothing's on sale. So it's basically just getting you back to that 25% off. And I'm, and I feel like there's this underlying principle at a lot of these stores for the uninitiated, not talking about Laura, she's clearly crushing it and go back and listen to what she actually did. But for me, 
25% off is still 75% on. Like that's basically the baseline that they're banking on the entire time. So you're basically paying a hundred percent of what they want you to pay. <laughs> yeah, that is a very, very valid point. And I've heard my entire life of, oh, this person in the family is so great at finding deals, right? Well, the stores are selling those items for that price. So <laughs> JC Penney's to- actually like, they actually tried to move away from this. They, they actually tried to say the price is what it is and get rid of sales and just lower the price by like 10% or whatever else across the board and just make it a hundred percent. People didn't purchase. They actually fired their CEO <laughs> because nobody purchased it when they just had a lower price with no sales. So they went back to 40% off, 35% off, and then jacked up all the prices to, to represent that just to get you back to where they needed to get you. And then the, the switch turned back on and people just came back. This is why I don't trust Kohl's where it has like the digital sale prices where you know if it's digital, they can press one button behind the scenes and instantly jack the price up to whatever they need it to be. I, I hear you. It's pretty amazing. So yeah, your point is very well taken about the 75%. You're still spending 75% on stuff you didn't want, right? If you're getting this magical 25% discount. So I think the moral of the story is you need to be aware, right? And don't get suckered in by, oh, there's a great deal. In our particular case, I needed jeans. And we're not getting suckered. We walked in there and because we use these two coupon and gift certificate in this case, we walked out of there paying essentially nothing. So huge, huge deal. But if we had walked in there and said, oh, well, we're buying this and that and we're getting it for two bucks, let's buy this other stuff for a hundred. Well, then we're the suckers because I surely don't need those extra clothes that I probably would never wear. So I think it's just important to get your mind straight. But yeah, I mean, if you can be disciplined, you're going to win. So Brad, let's go ahead and hop in and talk about this past week's episode with Waffles on Wednesday. There's so much here, and but I think we're, if I could pick where to start, and obviously I can as co-host of the show, uh, I want to start by talking about this game show Path to Fi, and not really talking about the game show, but talking about winning a non-cash prize. And he was talking about this $20,000 car that he ended up selling for fifteen, but received a tax bill for the income of twenty grand. Now, now, he was able to work that out, and in fact, he was able to get the IRS to acknowledge that it was a mistake and put an addendum at it that corrected it. But I just thought, like, you presented this point. We've all seen it. We've watched the HGTV show where the individual wins a what probably looks like a million-dollar house. Maybe it is a 1.5. Heck, maybe it's a $2 million house if you were going to appraise it with all the furnishings that they put in. Knowing what we know from this episode, it feels like that is the worst possible thing that you could win. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty brutal, right? I mean, obviously nobody's going to cry about winning a $2 million prize. So let's put that aside for now. But someone who wins this dream home actually probably wants to live in it in all likelihood. That's not impossible to believe. The reality of the situation is that's $2 million of taxable income. Clearly, obviously, that's going to put you in the highest marginal tax bracket. I mean, you might be looking at a tax bill of upwards of $800,000. So it's I don't know about you, but I sure as heck could not pay an $800,000 tax bill on a house that is just sitting there, right? You're not liquidating it. You just have to come up with 800 K out of nowhere. I mean, maybe I guess you could get a mortgage for it. I'm, I'm assuming you could get a $800,000 mortgage or home equity line, but then you have an $800,000 mortgage. And that's not exactly what you signed up for when you want a $2 million house. Now, the smart person who's listening to this podcast, which is probably everybody is saying, well, yeah, you still have $1.2 million in equity, but you have $1.2 million in equity no matter what. I think the most likely option is someone is going to sell that house and they have to be aware that, yeah, they're going to owe 800 grand. But it's sad, Jonathan, honestly, that people are pretty much forced to sell. There's almost no way around it. And I, I know I kind of joked about the HGTV dream home and Maybe that's a little sad that I even know that exists, frankly, but I saw, I think it was the most recent incarnation they were giving away and I could have this wrong. So I'm sorry about the details, but $250,000 in cash along with it. And they don't say this overtly, but I'm thinking, oh, that's to help pay for the taxes, but it's still not going to even come close to covering it, sadly. But that does at least make it more plausible. And like you said, it might be a million dollar house, right? And then you're talking maybe 400 K in taxes. So that's a different ball game. And now, obviously this is not going to be pertinent to everybody, right? No, in all likelihood, nobody listening to our podcast is going to win the HGTV dream home. But like you said, this is a larger issue about non-cash prizes, but really more importantly about taxable income and that 
items that you receive, or if you go to the casino and win a couple grand on a slot machine, that's taxable income. You're going to get a 1099 for that. Any income that you receive really should be reported. That's kind of the way it works. So keep that in mind. If you win something, there's a high likelihood you're going to have to pay tax on it. So please either reserve that money. And now luckily people in the FI community have assets, but reserve that money mentally, if nothing else, or send an estimated payment to the federal government and the state, because some people that's just a better option. Now, Jonathan, obviously I'm, I'm sure you're itching to jump in and say, but time value of money, you want to hold on to it, invest it and, and pay it at return time. And there is value there, but I'm just saying like some people like mentally to have that appropriate, either appropriated in their mind or segregated, let's say in a separate bank account or just sent to the federal government. But regardless of what you feel comfortable with, it's important to know the tax man is coming on this. That's the essential point. Yeah, no, I was not thinking that at all. I am not that aggressive when it comes to time value money in the IRS. The IRS terrifies me. And as a new entrepreneur, I try to stay as far ahead of it as possible. I'm probably more conservative than you just because it's my first year dealing with, well, I could, actually now I guess it's my second year, but it didn't really count because I only had like a few months of last year where it was fully on me to hold off the taxes for it. But I think this is actually a conversation worth having. I, I believe that as I started to look into why businesses fail, and get more data on that, it became apparent that one of the leading causes for businesses going under is a failure to properly reserve the amount of money needed for taxes. I think as an employee, maybe an employee transitioning to entrepreneurial work, you may take for granted that a lot of this is done for you using a W-4, where you basically set out your withholdings at the end of the year, they match up your W-4 and your W-2, and all of that comes together, and that is your tax return. The onus is on you as an entrepreneur to set aside that money. And it's not exactly the same as what it would be as an employee because you're also responsible for self-employment tax. I think this is probably an important conversation for our community. And so with that in mind, Brad, I thought what we could do is paint a scenario. I love when possible putting some numbers next to these. And there's a lot of assumptions that need to be made in order to really have a fully fleshed out scenario. But I thought just for the sake of simplification, we could paint this picture of this individual that they make $70,000 a year in their W-2 job, but they have been working on this side hustle. This is year one of their side hustle, and they can, they've can they already made their first couple dollars. And actually, it looks like if they were going to pursue the side hustle, by the end of this first year, they're going to make $10,000. And so with that in mind, they go ahead and make the decision to leave their W-2 job about halfway, maybe even three quarters of the way through the year. So for tax purposes, it looks like this individual of their $70,000 salary, they're going to end up bringing home about 50,000 of that. And then they're also going to make $10,000 from this side hustle slash business for the second half of this year. So they're going to have a blended salary this first year of about $60,000. Now I'm going to stop here because I think there's three different kind of scenarios that we should work through. And I'd love to get your thoughts on this individual that is making less than they would have made if they just stayed in their W-2 job. They've kind of got this blended situation where they have some W-2 income and they have some entrepreneurial income as well. All right, Jonathan. So yeah, this is, this is very important stuff and hopefully we can explain it clearly here. And I know you're personally grappling with this for the first time because you don't have a W-2 job anymore, right? And you need to make estimated payments. And I think that's, that's kind of the important first step is just understanding that you need to make estimates. Normally we get our W-2, we get a regular paycheck and there's withholding. So that money gets sent to the federal government and the state. And we'll just talk about the Fed here just for simplicity's sake. But, but know that if you look at your paycheck, there's a gross amount and then a whole bunch of stuff comes out. Payroll tax, there's federal withholding and state withholding. Those are the general ones. That money is not gone. It hasn't vanished. It just got sent to the federal government on your account. So that's withholding that is really your money that's sitting there because then you calculate your liability when you file your 1040. If it's less than that amount of your money that was sent there, then you get a refund of your money, right? And I, I'm purposely being silly here and emphasizing that because many people don't understand what refunds are. That's just a refund of your money that you sent on your account to potentially cover this liability. So hopefully that makes sense. But when you have a business, when you're self-employed, nobody's sending that money on your behalf every other week to the federal government. 
you need to do that now, right? So there are quarterly estimated payments and the due dates are April 15th, June 15th. So keep in mind, there's only two months in between there, September 15th, and then January 15th of the following year. So you actually get 15 days after year end. So the hard part comes in with, with actually calculating what you owe. It's difficult because sometimes, especially if you're self-employed, the money comes in, in ebbs and flows. It's not just like a standard salary, obviously, as, as we all know. So the way that I calculate what I need to send in is to avoid penalties. Now, Jonathan, hear, hear me out here because this is a little unusual. It's, it's looking at estimated payments through the lens of the FI community and through a FI mindset, which is I have assets basically to cover anything that arises. All right. So any, any major issue. So what this helps me with is actually smoothing out these estimated payments and reducing the stress, frankly, because I don't have to look at my current year income and do some fancy calculations and try to figure it out on a two or three month basis, which can get pretty overwhelming, especially if you're not a CPA, right? Like I'm a CPA, Laura's a CPA, and we still frankly don't want to do this. So what we do, and, and that's not to say that's implausible. Jonathan, I think you do that, but we can talk about that in a minute. What I do is again, it's to avoid penalties. So it's knowing the rules. This is another tenant of Phi life is understanding the rules of the game and trying to maximize them. So what I do is I look at the safe harbor provision for underpayment of estimated tax and just try to make sure I am covered on that safe harbor so I cannot possibly incur penalties. That's the key. I wanna send as little to the federal government as possible so that money is invested in my own accounts throughout the year. And then if at April 15th at, at tax return time, I owe additional money because, oh, poor me, I had a better year then I owe additional liability. But like I said, I have assets to cover that. So again, for me, it's all about avoiding penalties. So let's just very quickly look at the safe harbor provision. The foolproof version is as long as you pay in 90% of your current year's tax, then you cannot possibly get a penalty. But like I said, calculating your current year's liability is somewhat difficult because it's it's a moving target throughout the year. So I actually don't like that version of the safe harbor provision. What I do is I look at the safe harbor that's based on the prior year's liability. And now that is a known quantity. You just go to your form 1040 and you look at your total tax liability. So I'm looking at uh, the 2017 form 1040 page two. And I'm seeing my total tax on line 63. That's the amount that I need to base my 2018 estimated payments off of in this case. Now, there are two different versions of the safe harbor. Basically, if you are a normal middle class taxpayer or if you make a significant amount of money. So if you're a normal middle class taxpayer and your AGI, your adjusted gross income is $75,000 or less for a single taxpayer or 150,000 or less for married filing joint, then you base your estimates for 2018 off of 100% of your 2017 liability. So again, it's a known quantity, right? If line 63 said $10,000, then you pay $2,500 each quarter to the federal government in 2018, you're good to go. There is no possibility you will incur an underpayment of estimated tax penalty. That's a beautiful thing. And like I said, if your liability comes in for 2018 lower than that, then you get a refund. If it's higher, then you owe it, obviously. But again, that's an oh, poor me scenario where you did pretty well. Then you just owe that money, but you will owe no penalty. So that's a beautiful thing. And then if your AGI is over 150,000 for married filing joint or 75K for an individual, then you have to base it off of 110% of the prior year liability. So in this case, it would be, you'd calculate it off of $11,000. So you'd pay in $2,750 each quarter, not a dramatic difference. Obviously, if, if, if we're talking dramatically larger AGIs and, and tax liabilities, it would, that 110% as opposed to 100 would, would be bigger. But in this case, 
it's just important to know the rules. So Jonathan, does that all make sense as a background? Yeah, it was great because it was so dense and there's so much there. I'm going to try to slow it down and go back to the the scenario that we laid out. But I think your general principle is that you don't really look at what you're making in the current year in terms of what you're sending to the government in terms of estimated payments, not to say that you're not aware of it, not to say that you have in mind that you need to have a certain amount of money set aside, you know, at tax time, April 15th each year inside the United States. But with regards to what you're sending to the government in terms of estimated payments, it's just based on the prior year. So going back to our case study with this individual, let's kind of paint this three-year picture starting back at 2016. We know their tax return for 2016, the single individual making like 70K a year. And that year, their tax liability was around $8,400 at the federal level. Now in year two though, this is that, this is 2017 year two. Now they have this blended situation where they've got 50 K of regular income. They got 10 K of this entrepreneurial income using your strategy. They would just go back and they would look at that approximately 8,400 that they sent the government the prior year. That's what their tax liability was. And they would just break that up 25% at a time. And that's what they would send in for their estimated payments. But the the hiccup here is that half the year, the withholding was done for them. So this year, you know, they quit their job and maybe September ish. How does that play out for them, Brad, in your mind? Yeah, perfect. Perfect question. So yeah, in this scenario where, yeah, if they made 50 of 70 K in their day job, then yeah, they probably quit sometime in September. So I, I think what you actually interestingly have to do, you have to just look at your most recent or your last pay stub and see what the total federal withholding was for that year. Now, if you're one of these people, and hopefully there aren't too many in the FI community, but if you're one of those people who get a huge tax refund, then it's conceivable that the $8,400 was already withheld through the end of September. Now, again, I, I hope that isn't the case, but that <laughs> might be, right? So in this case, they would owe nothing for the last estimated payment. So I think that is a really simple way of looking at this. Just look at what you've sent already, look at what you have to pay for the safe harbor, and then cover any difference if you need to with maybe that last estimate that's due on January 15th of the following year. And if you've already overpaid, then, and again, that's overpaid for just for the safe harbor, then you're good to go. You don't need to send anything in. And again, Jonathan, in your scenario, they're, they're only making 60,000 this year as opposed to 70. So if they're already overpaid on that 8,400, then it's almost a certainty that they're going to get a tax refund. And Jonathan, another interesting wrinkle actually is since I said the original safe harbor is based on 90% of your current year's tax liability for this person's case, they're only making 60,000 as opposed to 70,000 from the prior year. So their tax liability is going to be less than 8,400 in tax year 2017. So that might be a little too complicated, but you know, I like to be thorough. No, but this is the way to look at it. So that's kind of why I picked this. So now let's move into year two. I originally was going to attach actual years of these, but I realized I'm going to lose track. So now we'll just talk about year two. This individual is a full on entrepreneur, no W2 income, but they're not going to make as much in year two. The side hustle has kind of blown up. It's four X, but they're, they haven't caught back up to what they were making the prior year. So they make $40,000 this second year. What is the play for this individual? Because you can see there's still a decrease here. Yeah. So in this scenario, I guess they're making two thirds of what they made the year before, because you're saying they made 60,000 in that first blended year, but 40,000 in this first full year as an entrepreneur. That is actually unknowable, right? On day one of that tax year, you have no idea what you're going to make. I think they need to kind of play by ear, like to see what do those first couple months look like. And Brad, this actually presents a very interesting point because what you're suggesting is actually, it's not quite as simple as always just looking back at that prior year and just paying, you know, basically a hundred percent of what you paid the prior year. Because in this situation, this is why I love actually having a study to apply this to you find that it's actually, you're kind of manipulating between the two safe harbor positions. And depending on where you fall on the spectrum, depending on whether or not your income is decreasing or increasing, there's actually a win for you with either scenario. With the ultimate goal in mind, we're not going to pay a penalty. Yeah, that is a brilliant point, Jonathan, perfectly summarized. So just be aware. Obviously, if your income tanks and it looks like those first three months that you only made a couple thousand dollars, then there's no conceivable chance that you're going to butt up against that 100% safe harbor provision, right? You would want to go back to 90% of the current year because 
obviously your tax liability is going to be dramatically lowered, at least based on that first quarter of the year. So yeah, it's just being loosely aware of these rules, I think will help you. Another factor, Jonathan, actually, that's important to note, especially if we're saying hypothetically, they're making 40 K in this first year as an entrepreneur. And let's just assume for argument's sake that it's, it's like a straight line thing. So they're making 10,000 a quarter, just again, for hypothetical purposes. So while they're making two thirds of what they've made the prior year, it's important to note that they owe payroll tax this year because there's no employer paying half of that payroll tax, social security and Medicare, or you're paying half of it as a W2 employee. But again, that kind of occurs in the background. In essence, if you look at your pay stub, you'll see it, you'll see FICA, et cetera, and that will come out, but that never makes its way to your form 1040 that you file. So it never made its way into the total tax liability, interestingly enough. So uh, for this first full year as an entrepreneur, you will owe both sides of the payroll tax. That's a real tax bomb, as we like to say, that you're just not considering. And I think, and don't quote me precisely on this, but I think it's 15.3% is both sides. At least that's what it used to be. It was 7.65 on employer and employee. So you do get a deduction for some of that. It's a weird calculation, honestly, and beyond the scope of this. But keep in mind that you're going to owe roughly, let's say, like 13% additional tax on your tax return. That actually makes it closer for someone like this who is making 40K as opposed to 60K in the prior year, that your tax liability might be closer to what it was the prior year. And therefore, you would want to pay in based on the prior year's tax liability. So Jonathan, I know that was very dense, but it's really important information. Did that make sense to you? Yeah, I, I would have to sift through it and probably listen to it one more time. Fortunately, it's a podcast and you can do that. But I, but I did have, I think probably if I were going to go back, I wanted to highlight. So for this person that's in year two and they're going to make $40,000, it's a decrease. They're trying to decide between paying hundred percent of last year's taxes or paying 90% of current year's taxes. The question I wanted to follow up on was, Since these are quarterly estimated taxes that this individual is sending in, we talked about penalties at the end of the year. Is there any sort of penalty if they don't pay enough on a quarterly payment? Like, for instance, you could see the individual paying like a smaller dollar amount earlier in the year and then a larger dollar amount later in the year. Is there any strategy there or anything that an individual should be aware of when they're thinking about how to send in these quarterly payments? Yeah, you're really stressing the uh, the limits of my knowledge here, Jonathan. I, I really should get Laura in on this. But my understanding is if you were calculating it based on current year, you could do an additional calculation and file an additional form, which you probably don't want to do based on underpayment of estimate calculations. And if you did have a scenario where you only made three grand in the first three months, but you made 25 grand in the final four months, it wouldn't be unrealistic to make unbalanced estimates, right? Because if you're going on, hey, I only made a couple thousand bucks this first quarter, I'm gonna send in a smaller estimate. That's perfectly plausible, but then you need to present that information to the IRS. So I think that's probably a bridge too far for most people. And that's why I personally always take the path of least resistance and I would pay in, just take prior year's liability, divide by four and send in that estimate. That's what I personally would do. But it's not unreasonable to go that extra mile, especially if it is that unbalanced. The thing is, you would be making those payments along the way if you're making it based on the current year's income and you have that information in hand and all you have to do is fill it in on one extra form. So, again, not unreasonable at all. I think it just shows you how important it is to be thinking about this stuff as a side hustler, as an entrepreneur, to understand the need every single time you get a paycheck to set aside some money for those estimated payments. Fortunately, if you're in the FI community, you have relatively large cash reserves or assets. This is not as big of a stretch, but imagine for the individual that hasn't been exposed to this information, is just trying to move from W-2 income to being an entrepreneur for the first year, but they haven't looked into the tax implications. They aren't aware of it. And then suddenly it's April 15th. They haven't set aside any money for taxes. They don't know how to file their quarterly estimated payments. It requires a little bit of knowledge and that knowledge, you just, you do not want to be on the other side of the IRS on this one. You, you really want to be playing it up front and have all of your ducks in a row. But the great news is if we can get past this point, this first year, right? Now we get to go to the next year and hopefully there's additional growth. And as I was playing this scenario out, I realized that I think I kind of want to change the scenario. Let's say for this year three, 
that this side hustler, this small business blew up and it's now at a hundred K. I think that gives us a different scenario to work with and to show the other end of this when it goes a little bit easier. So now you're making dramatically more than you made the prior year. You're making a hundred thousand dollars in this current year. Whereas in the past year, you only made 40 K. Now, Brad, I feel like the strategy that you laid out at the beginning really comes to bear. What would that look like for this individual? Yeah, Jonathan, that's very, very interesting. And, and I'll go into that in one second. I just wanted to point out two quick things about estimated payments. And you said about some people, they just sometimes don't withhold enough or they don't have the money lying around. And then you get into a scenario where, where you have a problem. Hopefully most people in the five community will not fall into that camp. But what I do personally is I basically appropriate those taxes that I'm going to send on a quarterly basis. I put it into a separate bucket. So for me, it's a, a different online bank that we have that exists solely to house this tax money that's going to get sent quarterly to the federal government. All right. So Big Earn might be mad at me here for because uh, since he doesn't believe in emergency funds, but I'd be curious to hear what he thinks actually about this particular instance. Sure. I could just put this money into BTSAX or some other investment and then liquidate some of it every quarter. But for me, this is just kind of the path of least resistance. We send this money monthly over to this online bank. And then quarterly, what I do is I set up an account with EFTPS.gov. Okay. So that's the federal estimated payment system. It's just an online thing. You do need to register because they send you like a pin and a login. So I wouldn't do this like the very first time that you owe on let's say April 15th and you decide, Hey, I'm going to send in an estimate on April 12th. You're probably not going to have enough time. So I would do this in advance, but yeah, EFTPS.gov. I just log in. I set up a debit from that online bank actually, and it just happens. All right. So my estimated payments get sent electronically. I'm not cutting checks. I'm not filling out vouchers or any nonsense like that. So, uh, yeah, just an extra little tip in there definitely worth it to sign up for one of those eftps.gov accounts. And Brad, I think a lot of the states also have something similar for the state estimated taxes as well. We're not going to go into that, I think, for the sake of this conversation, but it is worth noting that electronic systems often exist for estimated taxes for your individual state as well. Yes, you are 100% correct. And yeah, I just want to make sure that everybody's clear. I, I said before that I wasn't going to talk about state just because it would muddle the picture here a little bit, but it's essential that you also send estimated payments to your state. So obviously there, there may be different, slightly different rules on the safe harbor based on the state, but realistically it's gonna be pretty close. And also your state liability is dramatically smaller than your federal liability. So it shouldn't be a big hardship to pay in based on whatever the safe harbor is, 100 or 110% for that state. So for me, I would just take prior year's liability and pay off of that. And yeah, like you said, I know Virginia has an online login. I do the exact same thing. So really, really simple, but essential. And thank you for slowing it down and saying you need to send in these estimated payments for your state as well. All right. Just going back to the case study and, and this should be really pretty quick here for this last year. So even though they made, they're making dramatically more a hundred K as opposed to 40 K, which was their first year of full-time self-employment, let's say you can still use that safe Harbor. So now let's say their AGI in this scenario is going to be slightly over that 75,000. We don't know precisely, but let's just say, so that means that the safe Harbor is jumped up to that 110% of prior year's liability. So you would just look back at your tax return, your 1040 for that year where you made the 40 K look at the tax liability, multiply it by 1.1, right? And that's your 110% divided by four to get your four quarterly equal installments and just send that quarterly to the federal government. Now that'll cover you for underpayment. But again, crucially, you're going to owe a whole heck of a lot of money at April 15th of tax return time the following year. You know that for a certainty. Clearly, if you're going around buying expensive cars and champagne bottles and spending all your money, you're going to be in a world of hurt. It's right? a but summer if you're a, of George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. But, but if you're a smart Phi community member and you've been saving this money and putting it aside for taxes and knowing that it's going to be due, you'll be fine. It's just, just like anything in life, expectations management is essential. You're obviously going to owe a lot of money in tax return time. So 
please plan accordingly. And it's not just April 15th. As you pointed out, it's April 15th. And then two months later, not three months later, June 15th is going to come around the corner for those quarterly estimated payments. So, I mean, there is some, it's very much worth knowing what your year is going to look like as an entrepreneur that is responsible for reserving their own taxes. Jonathan, you actually stumbled on something that's really, really important there when you're saying June 15th and April 15th. And again, this is where it's going to get a little bit confusing just based on like, we're not using calendar years. We're using years, years so made up years in essence. In that scenario, when I was talking about the big amount of money being due April 15th of the following year, that's just for the tax liability owed on the hundred thousand. You're talking, you're in the next calendar year. You actually owe an estimate for that calendar year on April 15th. You owe the additional liability from the prior year. And then you're saying two months later, you owe another estimate, which is true. So there is a big amount of money you're going to owe on April 15th. <laughs> I because, felt that for the first year of this April. And I was like, why? How does anybody do this? This is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I can't give you any more money. <laughs> <laughs> I have no money left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like holding all my control, my tax rate sheets saying, what can I do? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, and hopefully this all is making sense. I, I really think this is good content. And if you need to go back and play this again for 20 minutes, this is good information that that's really important for the self-employed or whoever's looking to be self-employed. But yeah, that's a scenario where, again, you've kind of put aside this extra money knowing that you're going to owe it on the April 15th, but you still owe your following year's first quarter on April 15th too. So it's going to seem like you're sending the fed just a boatload of money, but those are the breaks in essence, right? Like you could have made bigger quarterly payments the prior year, but you wanted to be earning money on that. Again, I have it in an online bank, which is not earning a boatload, but it's still whatever it is, a percent or a percent and change. So that's my play. And for earning that little bit of money, I get the psychological hit in essence of having to send a big amount at tax return time. So that's something that I can deal with. And it's expectations management. As long as you know the rules, you have the money set aside and you understand that in all likelihood on April 15th of every year, you're going to be sending a lot of money in, but all the while knowing that you're winning at this game, you're not sending the fed all this money for them to sit on it and earn interest. You're earning interest on it. So Jonathan, any, any uh, last comments on this? Yeah. Basically highlighting what you just said. If you're trying to play catch up on this stuff because you said, oh, you know, I'm just going to pay the minimum that I have to pay for safe harbor provisions. You're the fast and loose type of individual. And you're like, and you know what? That's going to be easy. That's done. And then I'm not going to owe this money until next April. It's not your play money. It's not yours. Get your grubby hands off of it. You will regret it if you play it fast and loose and then you try to make up for it starting in January of the following year. And so Brad, Brad's advice that he gave to me that I've been doing is as soon as I get my check, I take my percentage that I've kind of set aside. This is what I need to cover. Depending on your marginal tax bracket, it could change. I think, Brad, you've said, depending on where you're at, it could be anywhere from 20 to 30%. That would be a reasonable amount to set aside from each paycheck, just depending on how you're kind of moving up the, the marginal graduated tax brackets. But having that set aside just gives you peace of mind. It's and, and have it in a separate bank account, just ready for this. You don't want to have it blended and mixed with your personal funds. If you want to optimize it at the margins and get a better return on it, like Brad was talking about, but I don't think Bitcoin is going to be a good play for you. So um, yeah, th that's my final thoughts. Brad, there will be some head spinning from this segment. I think it's probably one of the most valuable segments that we've taken the time to put together in a while, just in terms of raw information that's here that you probably would have trouble Googling and putting together on your own. I mean, really, it takes a while to piece this together and you're getting kind of the benefit of Brad being an accountant and being very precise with this stuff, but also making it relatable and hopefully helping you figure out how it would change, how you will shift depending on where you fall on this kind of blended case study that we pieced together. I wanted to go back to the episode that we did with Waffles on Wednesday. There's a couple other topics that we're going to be covering for you guys in the very near future. We have a voicemail talking about retirement planning uh, for the individual. We talked about a few of those topics in the Monday episode. We're going to come back and we're going to highlight that again just to make sure that you have everything that you need. Hopefully, you're fortunate enough to be in the situation where your side hustle has started to take off. You've got the tax angle covered and you want to know, well, how do I proceed with my retirement planning now that I'm on this alternate path? That is a conversation we want to have. We're going to circle back to that in the next few weeks here. The other thing that we're going to do that we briefly touched on in the episode is a uh, rent versus buy discussion. Uh, we're going to do a little compare and contrast. 
We're either going to do it with using Waffles on Wednesdays numbers in LA and comparing that to what Brad encountered with uh, his Richmond numbers. He is going to be meeting with Big Earn at FinCon and they're going to hopefully get a chance to go through some of those numbers. Earn will help them figure out how to use those in the spreadsheet. And we will uh, then present some of the findings to you on an upcoming podcast. But that's basically it. And if you got value from this segment, I wanted to go ahead and put out an, another call to action, I guess, or a call for voicemails, basically. This Friday Roundup is driven by the community. This is a weekly gathering place where we discuss your ideas, your feedback, and your questions. And in light of that, there are a few types of questions that we are really hoping to bring to the conversation. And in particular, we have talked about this in the past, but basically since you found the community action that you've implemented in your life and the effect that it has had, college hacking is another conversation that we're very interested in, tax strategies. We're also looking at, gosh, as I'm saying this, Brad, I'm thinking we really do actually need to make a formal list. I mean, college hacking, uh, side hustles, action that you've taken in your life since finding the Fi community, these all seem valuable, but I know there's more. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly more. And yeah, we have to get this defined list, but it's just important that we're specifically calling for these segments. And I think that'll that'll be fun. We'll have college hacking tip of the month or life hack tip of the month. And we'll kind of cycle through these on Friday roundups as opposed to just, it's always kind of bothered me a little bit that like we've said, hey, send us a voicemail. And again, like I know I said this last week or the week before, I wouldn't send in a voicemail if somebody just randomly said, send me some generic voicemail. No, we need your help. That's what we need because you have this wonderful information and the whole community can benefit from it. So you know the topics that we talk about. We talk about college hacking, second generation FI. We talk about jobs that could be valuable for people in the FI community, side hustles, any type of health and fitness or nutrition hack. All this stuff is really valuable. So please send it in and we will play these things. That's the crucial part here. You know we want to play these, so please send them on in. And if you want to call on a voicemail, just go to chooseify.com slash voicemail. And yeah, we would love to hear from you. Let's go ahead and crowdsource this, open it up to the community. And we got an email from Allie and she says, hi guys, I'm absolutely loving your podcast. I'm getting so much value out of it. Even as an international listener, I, one of the world's great introverts, even went to a Chooseify meetup last month, which was by far the least awkward meetup I've ever been to. So congrats on cultivating such a positive and healthy community. Now I have two wins that I thought you and your listeners might find value in one frugal and one productivity with a self-care twist. First, and this may not be news to many people, but if you have a basic white fridge or freezer, it works as a whiteboard. So to cut down on food waste through excess buying or freezer burn, I've started putting an inventory of my freezer on the front of it, which really helps with meal planning and being reminded that there is ice cream in there, so not all is lost. If you have a steel freezer, I would hazard a guess that this can be replicated by attaching a laminated sheet of printer paper to the front with magnets. Second win is what I call the three things rule. At the start of every day, I write down the three things that I really want to get done that day. For my personal life, this goes in my file facts. For my work life, my frugal facts, which I made with scrap office paper. I put a checkbox next to each thing so that I can mark it as done. On normal days, this helps by giving me a framework that I can work to prioritize my efforts and gamify my productivity. It's a lot harder to skip a Saturday morning workout if you put the checkbox down on Friday before the wine got opened, and it'll leave you with a blank checkbox for the weekend. It's also great for things that typically don't get done as often as they should without a plan, like washing the pet's bowls or churning the compost. On bad mental health days, however, no shame there, we all have them from time to time, it really comes into its own by taking the decision out of what you need to achieve that day and by giving you a visual confirmation that you have actually achieved three things that day, which can really help to keep that motivation going and those spirits up. The three things don't need to be epic. They can be as mundane and simple as you like and can achieve your current resources. Hope this helps. If not you, then someone else. Keep up the most excellent work. Brad, it feels like this is an adapted version of Todoist. I love it. Yeah, this is really neat. I certainly appreciate the email and somebody is going to be listening to this and put this into action. So, or many somebody is as it may be. So yeah, really cool stuff. Oh, and Jonathan, I've got a, a little segment, maybe the, uh, the fire is spreading news of the week, uh, <laughs> that might not uh, pass your, your test, but this was really cool. I, I noticed Barney, the escape artist and Ken from the humble penny who are the admins of our London group. 
they posted this article from the Daily Mail. So dailymail.co.uk, and we'll link this up in the show notes. How to retire in your 40s without earning a fortune. The simple formula catching on in Britain that lets modest income earners escape the rat race to live mortgage-free on 25,000 pounds a year. And yeah, it was really, really neat, especially because I was just in London and so many people were telling me there. Every single conversation I had was, wow, I can't believe how the fire movement is spreading in the US, but it just hasn't caught on culturally here in the UK at all. I really wonder if some of the major press attention we've seen in the US, like in the New York Times and and places like that, is kind of filtering over to the UK. Like, I wonder if that's what precipitated this article. But regardless, it was really neat to see them both featured. And yeah, this is an interesting article for sure. Yeah, I think when the mainstream media starts picking up articles in the future on our Friday roundups, we should start, especially if we see this trend continuing. And I, I think every single week over the last at least two to three months, I've seen at least one article about the FI community and one of the five or six major mainstream news outlets. And I think it would be cool just for us to kind of keep a tally and see if this trend continues through the remainder of the year. But this is a time for the FI community. We were kind of the cheerleaders, right, Brad, at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. Just we kind of were like, I think this is I think this is going to blow up. I feel like we're, we're in it now. It's actually coming to fruition. It's not just our echo chamber. It's not just our imagination. You actually are seeing the major news outlets reaching out to the individual characters that make up this community and saying, we want to share your story with our audience. Yeah, you're right. It is sometimes hard to tell from within our own little world. It feels like it's getting bigger, but we know it's getting bigger. You see it everywhere. And it's just amazing to see a lot of our friends featured in these remarkable publications and, and yeah, bigger and better things, right? Especially with the documentary coming out in January of next year and Who knows where that'll take this community? Well, I wanted to talk about that for just a second. Uh, Scott, who is obviously the creative force behind Playing With Fire, I just saw, he just put it on his Twitter feed, he has submitted the Playing With Fire documentary to Sundance. Now, I I messaged him about this, obviously, and I said, what? But he said, you know, it's a very, very long shot. It'd be very unlikely for them to actually pick this up. But what I heard is, you're saying there's a chance. That's what... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that would be amazing if it made it to Sundance Film Festival. And we saw a tiny little 30 second snippet of this and it is high, high quality. I mean, this is not some junky movie that was put together. This is an absolutely professional film. And who knows? It wouldn't shock me if it made it into Sundance. I really want to. I wonder if there's a way. Can can we impact that decision? I mean, is there something where you can cheerlead loud enough that Sundance says, you know what? Maybe it's worth it. I I don't really know. I'm not a social marketing type guy that understands all the ins and the outs of this stuff. But if we could have an impact, I feel strongly that they should consider this, this documentary for the festival. I don't know. A little bit biased, a little bit biased. (laughs) (laughs) And hey, you never know the power of our community either. Who knows somebody on the selection committee at Sundance Film Festival that's hearing this? Just talking about it can put it out into the world and, and maybe help it come to fruition. All right. Well, we will follow it closely and keep you guys in the loop. But I can tell you what will happen regardless of Sundance's, you know, decision on this is a screening tour. Uh, We've mentioned that in the past. Danny has reluctantly said, fine, you can have three weeks to do some of these screenings. Have you gotten permission to to do something? I have definitely gotten permission. I'm not sure what exactly that entails, but (laughs) yeah, I mean, at the very least, we're going to have some major screenings on the East Coast that I'll be attending. And yeah, in all likelihood, I could see a a West Coast swing as well. And who knows? Obviously, I don't want to exclude the middle of the country. So yeah, you might be seeing a a couple of uh, choose of I hosts at, at some cities across America. All right, man, 2019 is blazing toward us. What happened to 28? Oh, we still got a few months left. Let's not write it off yet. But I have one more email that I wanted to go ahead and read. And this is from Scott talking about the impact that the FI community has had on his life and on his families. He says, let me preface this email by saying, I am only recently learning about financial independence, retire early about this community. And I'm only on episode 14 of your podcast, but it's made a difference. My story, I'm currently living in California, married, kid, stable job and education, but growing up had no financial literacy. In fact, I got my first credit card, hopped in my car with my best friend and charged our way. I think he's talking about charged in terms of the swiping power effect, charged our way from the East Coast to Colorado, then took years to pay it back. All of this, despite the fact that I was waiting tables and bartending all through college and making a really good money. It was truly easy come, easy go. I was just frivolous and irresponsible. 
My wife and I started trying to get better with money about eight years ago by taking Dave Ramsey's course. It helped, but it didn't totally take or sink in. I'm not sure if it's where we were in our life or the content, but it was a good primer for your content. This past six months have been pretty crazy in my life with a lot of noise and negativity. So I quit all social media and really tried to press reset and focus on what matters, family, children, balance, health. In doing so, I kept one form of information, Reddit, and I came across the FIRE community through that platform. Man, has it been life-changing. In the past three months, I have soaked up information, your podcast, and am actively making changes. I recently looked at my 403B account that I started a few years back. I looked at the fee I was paying, 0.6, and just transferred my investments to Vanguard with a fee of 0.05. And the Vanguard has a higher ROI than what I was previously in. I would have never done this unless you had all shared the information that you did. I was also fascinated by your podcast in which the teacher from Georgia, and he's talking about Millionaire Educator, that's episode 13, maxed out so much that his paycheck was $2. It's just so invigorating to hear the positive stories. In other words, not the noise that's constantly surrounding us of people getting off the hamster wheel, taking control and finding ways to do life differently. Other steps that my wife and I have taken, we cut the cable and we bought a smart stream. So no monthly bill and only a one-time fee. We don't really eat out anymore. I've set up a fire Excel sheet tracking our assets and debts. I've started contributing more to my 403B. I've increased our savings rate and that's only in a few short months. Also, in January 2019, we're going to start implementing our travel rewards plan, and we're really looking forward to getting started with Southwest. I can't wait to continue this process and truthfully feel very invigorated and empowered. So from one listener in Southern California to you back in Virginia, heartfelt thank you. Your words and advice are making a difference to me, my wife, and my children. Wow, Scott, a heartfelt thank you for writing that in and for taking action. Jonathan, that makes our lives just better. That lifts me up just hearing that someone is listening to this podcast and taking action and really impacting their lives. Thank you again. All right, my friends. Well, unfortunately, that is going to bring this episode to a close. Now, as you know, we like to finish every episode by doing a drawing for a copy of a book that we have found useful. And there's a couple books that we offer. The first is J.L. Collins' book, The Simple Path to Wealth. The second is Dominic Cortuccio's book, Design Your Future. And the third book is Vincent Puglisi's book, Freelance to Freedom. If you want to enter the drawing, all you have to do, just go to choosify.com slash iTunes, follow the instructions there and leave us a written review on either iTunes or Stitcher and send us an email to feedback at choosify.com, letting us know that you left a review and what screen name you left it under. We give away one book for every five written reviews that we get and we announce a winner on the Friday roundup. Brad, how many winners do we have today? All right, Jonathan, we have one winner today, and the winner is Luke. And Luke said, I've been listening to Brad and Jonathan since the beginning and love how they started with the basics of financial independence and have graduated into so many more subjects that encourage listeners to live intentionally. This podcast is a great reminder to enjoy the path to FI and not lose the time spent getting there. One of my gripes with other people in this sphere is that their pursuit of FI seems pretty self-centered, and this outlet doesn't have that same flavor. Great guests good production quality, and a wide variety of subjects more than compensate for the hokey buzzwords Brad and Jonathan love to throw out there. I think we got to own that. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, that's us. Yep, (laughs) yep. find us here. (laughs) (laughs) Guilty as charged. But thank you for this uh, wonderful review. We appreciate it. All right, my friends, if you got value from today's episode, come on, I know you got value from today's episode. Take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. It just lets the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.